Hi colleagues, and thank you for joining us today for the launch of our General Election Manifesto. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Helen Kelly and I'm the Director of Communications, Campaigns and Digital here at Nautilus International, and I will be hosting the webinar today. As you will all no doubt all be aware, on Wednesday the 25th of May, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak announced a general election would take place on the 4th of July. It was a somewhat unexpected announcement, but you will be glad to know that at Nautilus we were already preparing for this eventuality with our manifesto, Turning the Tide, a mission to revitalise our nation's maritime sector. Today we will be taking 15 to 20 minutes to guide you through an introduction to this manifesto and we will also delve into details on some of our key asks, specifically on skills and training. This is a two-part series so please do join us on Thursday if you can. It's at the same time and we'll be going into more detail on other parts of our key asks such as protections for maritime employment and to advance a case for social and employment rights. There will of course be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the presentation. You'll see a Q&A function in the bottom right of your screen. If you have a question at any time during the webinar, please do submit it here and we will uh, put those questions to our speakers after the presentations. You can also copy a download of the manifesto. We've just put that in the Q&A box, so please do feel free to download that now or you can download it after the webinar from our website. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel to share afterwards. So please do hit subscribe to make sure that you don't miss out. Also, don't forget to follow us on our social media. We're on Twitter, now known as X, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram and TikTok. So you'll be pleased to know that's all the admin done. And without further ado, let me welcome Nautilus International General Secretary Mark Dickinson to launch the manifesto. Thank you, Helen, and welcome, colleagues. Lovely to see so many of you here on this webinar. Um, long time since we've done a webinar, I have to say. Um, during COVID, we did lots of them. So uh, it's good to see so many of you still keen to engage with us in this uh, using this uh, this this forum. Um, we're here today to uh, launch the manifesto, turning the tide, a mission to revitalize our nation's maritime sector. You can probably see the front cover, hopefully now on your on your screen. Um, I believe you've also been sent uh, a copy uh, as well directly. But as Helen says, you can also download it through the Q&A section. Now, the, the last five years uh, have been uh, rather uh, tumultuous for our members since the last general general election in 2019. We've had a devastation that caused by COVID pandemic and the subsequent crew change crisis to the war in Ukraine, uh, the impact of sanctions as a result of that, uh, that has affected our members in the super yacht sector in particular. And of course, we have our members and maritime professionals globally suffering the consequences of Houthi rebels targeting shipping in the Red Sea. Also, just cast your mind back to March 2022, we had the shocking actions of Pino Ferries. They sacked almost their entire UK resident workforce without consultation or notice and replaced them with exploited crew uh, from abroad, exacerbating the race to the bottom in terms of uh, in terms and conditions of employment for our nation's seafarers. At the same time, in the UK, we have been marred by political uncertainty, we've had three prime ministers, countless transport secretaries and maritime ministers in that period. One fact that underlines the gravity of the situation, we are now at historically low levels in terms of the numbers of UK resident seafarers and the number of UK uh, registered vessels. So at this critical juncture for our industry, we face a choice. Do we accept the uncertainty and decline? Or do we fight back to turn the tide for you and your colleagues uh, in the Merchant Navy and related uh, maritime activities? Turning the tide, the manifesto before you is our answer to that question. A general election campaign offers us, offers us the UK's largest maritime union, the opportunity to engage with political parties 
and candidates across the political spectrum on the much needed policies to support our industry and cru crucially our people. The manifesto before you is an ambitious and detailed document. It lays clear the challenges, not just those facing you, the maritime professionals and our members, but the challenges the UK will face if we fail to invest and support our vital industry, our merchant navy. You'll find a quote um, in my introduction to the manifesto. It's from Professor Geoffrey Till former head of defence studies at King's College. And I think this should be a guiding point for the next government. He said, a healthy merchant marine and secure sea lanes of communication are essential for national security in peace and war. In a time of increasing global precarity with war in Europe and in the Middle East, it has never been more salient for the UK government to recognise the strategic importance of our merchant navy for our national security and resilience. And the lessons of the pandemic where our country was left exposed must be heeded. But recognition is just the first step. It must be followed by action. Our manifesto, Turning the Tide, a mission to revitalize our nation's maritime sector, lays clear the action that is needed. We believe there are four key themes that need addressing, and they are future-proofing skills and training, guaranteeing a just transition, full protection for maritime employment, creating a stronger UK shipping industry domestically and internationally, and ensure continued international leadership on social and employment rights. Our first section, future-proofing skills and training and guaranteeing a just transition, I will touch on this section in more detail in a moment, but just let me give you a quick introduction to the other sections of the manifesto. So firstly, section two, that's about full protection for maritime employment. We are clear that any new government must learn the lessons from Pino ferries, but it's not just Pino ferries. There must be greater employment protections for all maritime professionals. This is critical to ensuring better jobs and underpinned by fair wages and decent working conditions. In section three, we elaborate further on the section entitled Creating a Stronger UK Shipping Industry Domestically and inter Internationally. So we want the next government to recognise the opportunities to grow the domestic shipping industry and grow the UK flag, particularly in areas of strategic importance and growth, such as offshore renewables. We've been promised an action plan to grow the UK flag. It's time to see the details of this plan. We must see the next government be proactive in growing our industry domestically. And yes, that means we need to consider the scope for cabotage. And finally, section four, ensuring continued UK leadership internationally on social and employment rights. The UK was one of the first countries to recognize CFRs as key workers during the pandemic. And it's vital the UK continues to advance the case for social and employment rights for CFRs pushing for, for example, for pushing for continuous improvement of the Maritime Labour Convention and leading a coalition of like-minded countries to tackle the corrosive impact of flags of convenience. Each of these themes have detailed policies underneath them, which, which will be explored in more detail in the next episode, as you heard Helen announce on Thursday, and that will be uh, introduced by Martin Gray, our Director of Organising. But let me come back to the job that I have today, and that is to talk a little bit more about the first section of our manifesto, which is focused on future proofing skills and training, training guaranteeing a just transition. Now, maintaining a robust, accessible and world class training regime is vital to support our maritime industry and our merchant navy. It's also crucial to keeping UK mariners competitive in a globalised labour market where Unfortunately, too many shipping companies see training and skills as uh, as only an issue that drives their bottom line. They're focused only on the bottom line and not the investment in skills that's needed. Now, this relates to our deep commitment to campaign for a just transition for our members. And those of you who attended the general meeting 
last year in Liverpool in October 23, we'll know that that was a key uh, discussion uh, for our general meeting uh, debates and policy adoption. Now, we know that the global shipping and industry has to decarbonize. The UK is committed to being a global leader in clean maritime with a target of net zero by 2050. The IMO is committed to net zero greenhouse gas emissions around 2050. Now, we also know that many of our members are skeptical about that target. While you may be right, and net zero around 2050 may or may not come to fruition, the fact is that the industry is still going to have to decarbonize with, and move away from heavy oil and marine diesel to alternative fuels like LNG, biomethane, ammonia, and even to full electric for some indeed, this is already happening. But it's not just about decarbonization. As investments are made in new fuels, we know investments will also be made in other technologies to lower and phase out greenhouse gas emissions, but also in parallel to increase automation. At Nautilus, our mission is to ensure a just transition, which means putting our members at the heart of these changes, ensuring no one is left behind. In this manifesto, we lay out key reforms needed to our maritime training system so the UK isn't just working towards being a global leader in clean maritime, in technology and innovation terms, but also having the skilled people to properly utilize the new fuels and new technology. To achieve this, we must acknowledge existing issues within the training regime. While there are noble efforts to widen participation in maritime training, we cannot lose sight of the fact that the financial support or lack thereof, available cadets has created a barrier to young people, particularly from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, from accessing cadetships. So this is amongst the reasons why we have for, long, for a long, long time been calling for 100% government smart funding, increasing that from the current 50% that is in place. And this would allow training bursaries to be increased and be set at a level that would support the cost of living pressures experienced by many cadets seeking to make a career in maritime and make it more attractive and crucially more accessible. What would that cost? Of course, that would be an extra 15 million pounds. We suggest that's a drop in the ocean, but 15 million on top of the existing 15 million we're looking at a, com a commitment to 30 million pounds per year tra uh, commitment to smart smart training. Now, when we when we talk about investing in training, it doesn't just mean injecting cash. It also means a return. And the solid evidence shows maritime training is just that a sound investment. An independent review by Oxford Economics found that for every pound spent by government on maritime training, £4.80 is returned to the Treasury. So for that £30 million investment in skills, £144 million would be returned to the National Exchequer. It's a no-brainer. And that's why the next government should commit to covering 100% of smart funding. And then it also removes one major stumbling block. Ship owners claims that it, this, even with 50% smart funding, is still much too expensive a place to train. We need to remove that excuse. But increasing accessibility isn't just about financial support. It's also about the quality of training and the sea time experience. Unfortunately, the disparate nature of UK maritime training, particularly when we think about training providers who undertake training on behalf of sponsors, means the quality of training varies from cadet to cadet. These training providers are central to the current training regime, yet they are not directly accountable to the Maritime Coast Guard Agency or the Department for Transport. And this, we believe, has led to inconsistent quality across the system, but in worse, it's led to training providers failing in their duty of care to cadets. 
including failing to properly investigate issues as serious as alleged, alleged sexual assault. So I mentioned at the beginning the impact of COVID-19 and the crew change crisis. Some training providers simply turn their backs on cadets who were being denied repatriation and consequently were left stranded at sea. We often talk about learning the lessons of the pandemic, and this is one, the unaccountable nature of the current training system with training providers, it's not fit for purpose. So this is why we, alongside the Maritime Skills Commission, are calling for a single national maritime training provider that is publicly accountable, that exists to support maritime skills and training. It's not for profit, and it's charged with putting the needs of our industry first. We cannot talk about maritime training and cadetships without menacing, of course, the tonnage tax. As many of you will know, tonnage tax is a system where ship owners pay tax on tonnage rather than profits, and in return are required to fulfill a minimum training obligation, training one cadet for every 15 officers in post in the company. The original purpose of the tonnage tax was clear. It was twofold, to give shipping companies stability throughout fluctuations in profitability by paying tax on tonnage, not profits, and crucially to support the training and employment of UK cadets in, in creating a robust pipeline of UK qualified officers whilst also promoting the UK flag. However, as I highlighted earlier, the number of UK resident seafers and UK flag vessels is at an all time low. It's clear the tonnage tax system isn't delivering on its objectives. This is why we need a comprehensive review of tonnage tax with a view to restore the system back to its original purpose to support the training and employment of UK seafarers and yes, grow the UK flag. At international level, the STCW is undergoing a comprehensive review at the International Maritime Organization. It's critical that the next UK government plays a full and active role in this review, working with the trade unions to ensure it's amended to reflect the rapidly changing skills arising from the transition. We must ensure no one is left behind from the transition. That's why our final proposal in this section of the manifesto highlights the need for the next UK government to develop a just transition fund to support training and upskilling. The government, the UK government has implemented a multi-million pound fund to support technological and fuel innovation in the form of the Clean Maritime Demonstration Competition, or CMDC. We need to see the same investment in skills or the technology is redundant. This isn't just about the CFRs of the future, but it's about you now working in the industry. That's why we believe the UK government, the next UK government, should link the CMDC with training to ensure any company competing for public money to support innovation in clean maritime is also required to, pro to prove its commitment to supporting our maritime professionals and building the skills base needed for the future. Future proofing skills, preparing our future generation, but also the current cohort for the transition is absolutely vital to turning the tide and growing our industry and our merchant navy. But this is just the first section of the manifesto. There is much more to follow in part two on employment protections, job growth, and international leadership on social and employment rights. And you'll hear more about that if you can attend on Thursday when my colleague Martin Gray will lead you through further sections. But hopefully you can see from this first section, Nautilus is committed to working with whoever forms the next government to implement detailed and ambitious policies to support you, our nation's maritime professionals, and turning the tide on uncertainty and decline. Thank you, colleagues. And uh, I'll now hand back to Helen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. I'd like to bring in Robert Murta, our communications campaigns organised, to give a brief update on our outreach work that we're doing on the manifesto during the election period. Hi, Robert. Uh, hi, Helen. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, Mark, for that. Um, 
you know, uh, tour of our future proofing skills uh, and training section of the manifesto. As um, colleagues, you will be um, aware there is not much point in having a manifesto and detailed policies if we aren't going to do any outreach on it. Um, so you'll be glad to know that we are um, out, uh, doing some outreach to candidates um, across uh, the UK, particularly candidates in coastal constituencies, those with high levels of uh, Nautilus uh, members. Um, what we have done is, is we so we've sent them the manifesto, but what we are asking them to do, we have taken the manifesto, looked at the key principles in the manifesto, some of the key the key points, and we've turned this into our uh, Maritime Workers Pledge, which is what we are asking uh, candidates in this election uh, to support. Support. So we, we've, we've begun that outreach. We actually started this outreach um, yesterday. So you can see there, you know, that some of the key points to prevent another p &O scandal, to support good jobs and fair pay, support a just transition, enhance seafarer rights internationally and tackle uh, flags of convenience. And this is really just breaking down the key points in our manifesto, asking those MPs to support it. I think it's really important just to say that we're asking them to support it really to give an indication of their commitment uh, to maritime and to seafarers. And really what we're using this is as a, as a jumping off point. We are going to have a new, a new well, sorry, who knows? We might have a new government. It looks like we'll have a new government. We're going to have a lot of new MPs. And so there's going to be a huge job of work to do for us to work with the new MPs um, to try and get them on board with um, what we are trying to achieve in this manifesto. And this is the first step in building that relationship. So, um, yes, we, we are, we're reaching out. Um, and if you want to reach out to uh, candidates in your constituency, uh, do uh, give us an email, campaigns at nautilusin.org, um, and we can send you what you need. And if you need any help or advice and what to say or what to write to your MP or your local candidate, sorry, um, then please do uh, reach out. But this is the, the pledge that we're asking uh, candidates to take in this election. Thanks, Helen. Yes, thank you, Robert. Uh, if any members on this call would like to do some outreach work and to contact the candidates in their constituency, then please do get in contact with Robert and he can assist you uh, with that work. We've got um, some good messaging there. We can give you um, you know, a starter email that you can tailor uh, for your own purposes um, and just give you some help and advice. So please do get in contact. So you'll be really pleased to know that we now have uh, the opportunity to put some question to Mark and uh, also to Robert, if uh, anybody would like to ask me about that outreach. But if I may, I'd like to start with the first question. Um, I'll put this to you, Mark. You, you mentioned that the number of UK resident um, and number of UK registered vessels, so both seafarers and vessels, are at historic lows. Why do you think this is? OK, um, I remember to unmute myself so you didn't have to remind me. Um, well, OK, this is the bit I've been really looking forward to, a nice little to and fro and questions and answers. It's it's uh, it's uh, adds a bit of excitement to these proceedings. So thank you for that first question, Helen. Um, let me tackle this in two parts. Well, first of all, the numbers. Well, look, you know, Tony's tax was introduced in 2000. Um, the. The targets that were being talked about right then was around 1,200 to 14 each year needed to be trained. At best, in the last 24 years, we've averaged around 700, 750, peaked in about 2008. Incidentally, just before the financial crisis, at around 920. Um, so we've never hit our targets. We've always underperformed. Uh, now, those targets were just about what the tonnage tax was delivered, which is about one. It was the one in 15 core training commitment. It was also about ship owners pledging to train 25 percent above what the tonnage tax would deliver. And they never delivered. And so the best you could say about the tonnage tax in terms of the skills element uh, is that it slowed down the, the decline. We've got a we've got a serious demographic problem in our industry. Average age of the sea for us is it is falling, but it, it had been rising for many many years. And probably your typical British uh, merchant navy officer, a British sea for probably looks a bit like me. I'm 62. I joined in 19 the merchant navy in 1978, um, and probably in the last great influx into the merchant navy at that time. And uh, there's only been bad news ever since really i mean obviously the tonnage ton tax was a major fill-up and it has made a significant contribution if we look at just look at our membership uh, as nautilus obviously significant numbers uh, we we would expect to see at least 85 percent of merchant navy officers joining nautilus that's what the density we maintain 
Um, and we can see that a significant proportion of that is now under 35. Um, and that's the, the people who've been coming in through tonnage tax. So it has had an impact. Uh, but and uh, but I'd say it hasn't grown the skills. It slowed the de slowed the decline. And in terms of the flag, well, the flag the tonnage tax doesn't have a flag requirement. It's flag blind. It's quite typical in tonnage tax systems across the world. Um, and um, again, it comes down to ship owner commitments that they, they don't deliver. Um, and also, I have to say, um, the government supports the Red Ensign Group, which is a bunch of former colonies, Crown Protectress, like we're talking, you know, the, the, the Isle of Man, the, the uh, Bermuda, Bahamas, uh, sorry, Cayman Islands, British Virgin Islands. You know, you're basically propping up the competition. They're supported by the Marine Coast Guard Agency um, for no reasons that anybody can explain to me that makes any sense. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they meet regularly. They, they are basically propped up and supported by the government. Uh, which is a bit like Marks and Spencer's supporting Lidl and then complaining that they're losing customers. Uh, I think it's pop that basic. Um, so that that doesn't really help. And a third reason, I would say also politicians, they get kind of bored and they move on to other issues. So they in in, in 2000, we had a new Labour government in 97. They had a policy called Charter in the Future, had 39 recommendations. At best, they delivered half of them. Of course, the jewel was the tonnage tax and smart funding and that kind of thing. So they delivered the big things, but then they lost interest and moved on to other priorities. And we've seen the same with Maritime 2050. So, you know, we had that introduced in, I think, 2018 on the back of the great uh, growth study. Um, and they haven't delivered uh, on some key objectives like the National Maritime Training Organization, um, like 100 percent funding, which the Maritime Skills Commission supported. So. You know, I'm hoping that a new government might be uh, more determined to deliver the entire package rather than cherry picking some of the easy, low hanging fruit. And incidentally, while I've got the floor, Helen, if you don't mind, I've seen a question from from Alan Dixon that he asked me specifically about the National National Maritime Training Organization. Uh, he, he's, he's basically answered that question for himself because, yes, indeed, Alan, it would replace all the plethora of of individual training providers to create one central body with a, with regulatory powers to look after the interests of uh, the cadets, the trainees, uh, and also drive uh, government policy um, rather than leaving it to the sort of whims of of of, uh, of of the whims of the ship owners who sponsor and the training providers who deliver. So I think that's enough from me at this stage. Thank you, Helen. Yes, thank you, Mark. And um, also thank you to Alan for putting that question in the Q&A. You anticipated my next one, Alan, so we're obviously thinking along uh -huh. the same lines. Um, but I can see, Stephen, you've got your hand up. We don't have the function to take um, uh, questions in person. Would you be able to put your question in the Q&A function? You'll find it at the top of your screen. It is second to right. It's a big button up there that is just called Q&A. Click on that and you can put your questions to Mark um, and to anybody else on the call. Um, I hope you can find that. Um, if not, um, I can go on to another question for you there, Mark. You also talked about COVID-19 pandemic and, you know, we all kind of lived through that. We know how difficult it was for seafarers, people who were at sea, but also those members who were stuck ashore at the time. We obviously had the crew change crisis with those uh, seafarers um, unable to disembark and, and come home to see loved ones. What do you think are the main lessons to learn from from that situation? Thanks, Helen. Yeah, that's a really that's a really important uh, question. And I did talk a little bit at the, the manifesto talks a little bit in more detail about the sort of case for, for governments to think about shipping in the context of national resilience. I think COVID showed that we weren't ready for it. Um, we weren't ready for it at so many levels, but we weren't ready for it from the point of view of being an island nation dependent on 95% of everything coming to and from the shores um, by sea, including, you know, ironically, medical supplies and and and, and even and even vaccines that were being produced in 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 Europe. But I think the the bigger picture is is comes down to uh, a phrase that uh, pr probably invented by Nautilus or so probably Newmast back in the day, which is sea blindness. And um, what I mean by sea blindness, because sea blindness works on so many levels. I mean, sea blindness could basically be if I stop my neighbours and ask them what do they know about the Merchant Navy, they know nothing. Um, that level sea blindness, then that feeds into 
um, how many kids want to join the Merchant Navy? How about they know about that option? Do their careers teachers know? So that's another level of sea blindness. But the level that I'm referring to, and I think that COVID showed, shone a light on, is government level, where they don't even understand what we do so, to the extent that they lock shipping out of their ports. They lock their own seafarers out from returning home. I mean, that is just mind-blowing. And many of you will have seen my frustration being exposed on 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 twitter when i was a member of twitter or x or whatever they call it these days and and on youtube etc on videos where i couldn't help myself because it was so frustrating and so shocking and so obviously blowing your own foot off um that's the level of sea blindness that covid really really turbocharged and shows and that's something we are very dedicated in Nautus. I'm not trying to claim that we're the only ones. I know, for example, within the ITF, the International Transport Workers Federation, largely because we keep going on about it, they're also seized of this, this particular issue. As are many ship owners. I mean, let's give let's give credit where credit is due. Many ship owners were, were as angry about the situation as, as we were, as unions representing seafarers, and they were frustrated from delivering their obligations. It wasn't a question that they didn't want to repatriate their crew or give them access to medical care ashore. It was that they could not. So the big task for us and the real COVID lesson and the crew and about the crew change crisis, which incidentally, you, you can blame Ukraine, Russia, and you can blame war uh, for economic uh, turmoil and the cost of living crisis but actually it was essentially the crew change crisis the resulting dislocation in supply chains and all the problems of that, that cause that led directly to the cost of living crisis so again another level of sea blindness they don't even recognize the consequences of their own acts and that's our job and it's the job of uh, others but primarily uh, uh, the representative seafarers to remind politicians remind government how crucial and important, particularly as an island nation, to have a resilient, uh, growing merchant navy with people from your country to staff qualified people, competent people. Um, and, you know, the whole thing is a virtuous circle. One pound gives you four pound 80 back. I mean, who wouldn't be interested in a deal like that? So it's the manifesto is very, very much in that space addressing that sea blindness, addressing the importance of resilience, national security, and investing in, in our maritime skills, and yes, growing the, U, the UK flag. Thanks, yeah, we so. also talk about that genuine link, don't we, between uh, the flag state and um, uh, the ship owners and the shipping um, uh, assets themselves. So uh, that's one of the key parts of our manifesto that was uh, really shown to be a real weak link during the pandemic, wasn't it? And we'd really seek to reinforce an um, article, I want to say 51, but I've probably no, got 91. that wrong. There yeah, you go, 91. Of UNCLOS. Yeah, can you, can you talk us through yeah. that a little bit, please? Yeah, for, for any students of international maritime law, uh, UNCLOS, uh, I'm sure it's on the agenda, but then have a read, Articles 91 and 94 of the essential uh, clauses to to be aware of but you know a, 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 any any country can set up a flag uh, and take ships onto their registry that seems to, that's a right of theirs under international law but of course what what often gets overlooked is that they're also obliged to run those flags in in a, in a competent and uh, 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 way and they do they they, that is supposedly guaranteed by establishing a genuine link, i.e. the ship owner needs to be based in that country. Um, uh, for, certainly for flags of convenience, that does not exist. And uh, as a consequence, they're an abrogation of international law. Um, and another part of the kind of that they, they are the consequence. Sea blindness is the consequence of the growth of flags of convenience because and COVID again uh, is such a uh, uh, signs such a dazzling light on this problem because you 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 might recall Helen there was quite a to do uh, on the social media in fact we we generated much of it around Panama's decision to keep extending the S the CFRS employment agreements for CFRS on Panamanian ships meanwhile they were holding themselves up for uh, for praise by facilitating crew change in Panama. The biggest register in the world thought it was doing the right thing, and it clearly wasn't doing the wrong thing by facilitating crew changes in Panama. But this somehow equated to 
an experience on Panamanian ships for, for seafarers on those ships, because there's 5,000 or more ships out there. None of crew, no crew changes were being affected in that respect. And they were simply extending the employment contracts beyond the 12 month maximum limit. Actually, it's 11 months because they're supposed to take their leave for, for seafarers on Panaman ships. And at one point when it got to 17 month extensions, we called them out um, because no longer did force majeure exist. And um, of course, they were not very happy about this and they rescinded it because of the pressure that was piled onto them and the criticism from all sides. Um, so that's just me giving you an example, a hard example of how flags of convenience has this sort of pernicious impact and how it uh, uh, erodes uh, and, 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 and turbocharges that race to the bottom. That uh, There are many other examples we've mentioned, P&O Ferries. Um, but these are the things we have to deal with. And these are the things we need governments to take seriously. We need to say, look, you know, there is international law. Let's how about do something novel. Let's stand for the application and enforcement of international law. Let's start with UNCLUS. Let's make sure that the MLC isn't just swept, swept aside the next time there's a health pandemic or some other inconvenient occurrence that means that seafarers, oh, you know, we can't enforce that. We can't do that. Let's hold those to account who try to evade their responsibilities and their rights. And one of the key lessons from COVID is that governments must coordinate with each other. That's a requirement under the convention to make sure that the rights and protections in MLC are afforded to seafarers in all circumstances. Um, you know, that's, that's just fundamental for us. And uh, it's frustrating because of sea blindness when people don't get and understand that basic uh, proposition. It's a big job for us, but... You know, we're committed to doing it and we will be loud and use every opportunity. A general election is just one opportunity to remind everybody. It absolutely is. And as we said before, if anybody on this call does want help in um, speaking to or um, addressing the candidates in their own constituency, we can certainly help them do that. Yeah. Let's get the message out now before the new government is formed. Um, and hopefully there will be more awareness of you know, of the members of that government, whichever stripe they turn out to be. Look, yeah. I've got some questions actually coming through on my WhatsApp. So people are being creative on the ways that they're sending their questions through. Thank you, everybody. Clive Evans, can Nautilus help the sea ambassadors system? When I went to schools, the career teachers had no idea about the Merchant Navy or who to contact. I mean, well, this is so much more of our sea blindness, isn't it? But yeah. Mark, what do you think about that sea ambassador system? Is that one that we can um, uh, utilise? Yeah, we should be utilising it. We do support it. I know that David Appleton and others um, are very committed to that. I just recently signed up as an ambassador myself and I've registered my local school just up the road here in case they um, are interested and I'd pop along and, and talk about the, the, the career at sea. I, I just, despite all the issues that we that we are all very familiar with on this call, um, and anybody active in Nautilus knows there are many, many issues that we, we have to respond to. But it still, for me, remains a really, really uh, fantastic career opportunity. I look at my own experience and, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm absolutely convinced I made the right, right step and I would recommend it to, to anybody. But there's, there's a lot more work going on in that space, Clive, than, than in, in past times. I know, for example, um, there's new films being done via Careers at Sea. So that's led by the MNTB. And we're obviously, we're very we're very much a partner of the MNTB. We're heavily engaged in the MNTB. There's also work being carried out through Maritime UK, which looks at the sea career as a, in the broader context, emphasising that there's this huge maritime cluster that needs those maritime skills and experience. So there's two, two parallel and they are coordinated and they are being called upon to coordinate even more. So there's the Chamber, MNTB, Nautilus, RMT, Careers at Sea, MNTB, and then there's Maritime UK um, also promoting careers in, in the maritime industry. And we must continue to do more of that. It needs more funding, of course, but uh, I can reassure Clive that we're very, very committed to enhancing that. It It is it is important to remember that the Merchant Navy and Maritime isn't one organisation. And I only say that because I was about to say, and I will now say, that I often look on at the Royal Navy, on the Royal Air Force, and I see what they do and the resources that they deploy. We don't have that. and We don't have one single entity to target either. We have 
it's like herding cats uh, in the shipping industry with so many um, companies, so many stakeholders. But uh, nonetheless, that shouldn't put us off. There's a goal there. We can see what others do by way of promoting that industry. And I mentioned the RN in particular because like the Merchant Navy, the, the two go together. It comes back to that strategic resilience and security point. The two go together. If you want strong naval defense, you need a strong Merchant Navy. How many times in history has that been proven to be true? We must never forget that and remind the politicians and at this key moment, remind them always that it's really important. And the skilled element cannot be separated from that. And that's one of the strong cards we have, and uh, we need to play it very, very determinedly. So thanks for the question, Clive. Yep. Thank you, Clive. Uh, we've got a question coming in from Steve Clinch. Hi, Steve. How are you doing? Uh, it's a little bit long, so bear with me. Mark, I agree it's important that the UK government is front and centre for the forthcoming review of the STCW. However, in my experience over the last few years, is that the MCA has been instructed to be less proactive during IMO meetings, going with the herd. Also, I understand the DFT is now taking on the role of PRIMO, rather than the MCA. This might change with the change of government, but I'm afraid the knowledge slash experience within the UK delegation is being eroded to the extent that its capability to be proactive in a positive way, whatever the outcomes of the election, may be severely limited in the future. Any views on this? Wow, that's a, some question, um, uh, Steve. Uh, thank you for it. So there's so much in that that uh, I, I, I will comment on. Um, Look, I'm I'm not so much an insider in government and MCA DFT uh, to know whether they uh, are less proactive or, or or more proactive. I kind of think that my my experience, therefore, is is that they that they when motivated, they can be very proactive. When I think about their attempts to have a discussion around safe manning they find themselves in a group of one um you know lonely a lonely uh, furrow to plow uh, but nonetheless they have made commitments in the past to do so it's in maritime 2050 and they do they they have been supportive of our efforts as as a union to to get that issue on the table They're supportive of the issue around hours of work and rest which were addressing and Steve will be familiar with around some World Maritime University research, which is about to go live. So um, that's a kind of that's one for me to take away, I think, and and, and monitor. I, I would say and I'll say it now publicly on this call. I've not heard a peep from the new chief executive who must have been in place at least over a year. Now, I will work very closely with the predecessor, Brian Johnson. Um, and maybe there's the answer, but um, I bet the bet she's met the chamber um, often. And I was just mulling this over this morning as to what I'm going to do about it. Um, going with the herd mentality amongst governments, I think. Well, you know, we have been in the EU um, for best part of the last forty years, I think, or uh, I should know the precise figure, but maybe it's about forty years. Um, and obviously the. Uh, Many of the issues that would have uh, would have been um, being debated and, and progressed with through the IMO would have been coordinated by the uh, by the I uh, by the by the EU by the Commission. So I guess going with the herd perhaps um, has meant towing the towing that consensus line. And I guess we wouldn't I wouldn't know for sure how how aggressive the uh, UK would have been in pursuing its issues within that dis within those disclosed discussions. Um, the the primo primo role is an interesting development recently with changes in the DFT. Um, it seems like somebody there fancies uh, taking on the role of primo. Um, which is the permanent representative at the IMO for those who aren't familiar with that acronym. And what I would say is I certainly agree with with the implication of uh, Steve's question is that you don't just rock up to the IMO and start telling people what to do. IMO uh, is 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 a bunch of technical people in a room 
and they respect their fellow technical people who commit to the organization. And that means attending, you know, something like 36 weeks of meetings a year, which is why we we commit to that. We have David Appleton um, almost at every one of those meetings. Occasionally, we also send our legal director, Charles Boyle, along the legal committee and that kind of thing. And you have to be committed to that. You have to dedicate the resources to it. It's time consuming uh, and it's costly, uh, but it's important because that's where you're framing the very basis of of all um, qualifi- uh, all rec- uh, all regulations that then will end up as UK regulations, will end up as Dutch and Swiss regulations as well, but in terms of UK. And and if you want to influence that, you do it at the IMO. You don't wait until you've, you've got a fait accompli at national level. Um, people cannot just wander in, um, you know, sit down and expect the world to listen. They need to know you're committed. They need to know you know the detail. Uh, you need to walk the corridors. Uh, you know, walk the cafe in the IMO, sit down, talk to other delegations and build that confidence and trust and lead. Um, And uh, I would be, I'm I'm actually quite worried about that development that the the outgoing Premier has has basically been pushed aside for for somebody else. So thanks for flagging that up, uh, Steve. It's 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 a real risk there that we need to be thinking about. Might I just say, though, about the IMO and, and the manifesto commitment uh, that we're calling on governments to commit and lead in the IMO. Um, what I would say is that if we if you cast your mind back to the publication of the Maritime Skills Commission report on the CFER Cadet Training Review, um, which incidentally called for a national maritime training organization to take over the role of training providers, it called for 100 percent funding for SMART. Um, but it also it, it also said very clearly that STCW is not a target for the UK. It's not the the floor, the roof or the ceiling in UK training standards. It said we are beyond the IMO STCW and we must continue to be beyond STCW. So the end of the road is not STCW for us, but clearly STCW needs to keep pace with changes and modern working practices and new ship designs and indeed new fuels. But for us, we must maintain a system beyond that. And that means we are we will always be more expensive. But we believe with justification that our training system produces amongst the best maritime professionals in the world. If you want the best, you need to pay the best, retain the best. Um, and that's what this is this, that's what this is all about. Of course, we don't want the minimum to fall too far behind because that would just open up a competitive gap. Um, But somehow we have to navigate that, that international minimum standards should never be the target for UK maritime. They should only be the floor. And we want to make the good operators, the, the very best operators, the highest tech ships with all the new fuels and all the new changes and 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 digitalization incorporated. They're going to need highly qualified maritime professionals, and we'll be there with a with a constant source and supply of people who can who who fit that description. So I don't know whether that was an answer to that question, Stephen. Uh, that threw me a couple of curve balls there, but I hope that's okay. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Stephen. And just as uh, to let everybody on the call know, uh, we are actually speaking to IMO Secretary General Arsenio Dominguez are, tomorrow. Yeah. We are. We, we, he has agreed to a video interview with Nautilus International. We will be putting a lot of those points that Mark has just raised to him. So around decarbonisation, around the just transition, around the skills um, format, and how the IMO and its member states can support, you know, the uh, continuous improvement uh, of of all of those things. So, uh, so again, keep an eye on our YouTube channel. Hit subscribe. Make sure you don't miss it. It's a real coup for the comms team, uh, Helen. Well done. Thank you. Well, we'll wait and see how it goes. But yeah, okay. um, we, we've got Clive Evans. Clive, interesting point that you make here. Your local MP is Mike Kane. Um, uh, can we please send as much material and manifesto him as possible? He's Labour's shadow shipping minister and not impressed with his performance to date. So I think we might like to hear a bit more about that. But of course, we will send him all the information. We're not party yeah. affiliated, are we, Mark? So no. we will be approaching all the candidates yeah. um, equally to make sure that they have all the information possible but mark do you want to add anything there in terms of um uh mike kane specifically no, we we've been working well with 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 his with his team to make sure he's fully briefed of course as clive says he is the maritime the shadow maritime 
minister and uh, and clearly we keep an eye on the polls as much as anybody else does and uh you know we, we we've clearly been trying to i was at the parliamentary uh, seminar recently i think it's featured in this month's telegraph um that was hosted by um well rmt and nautilus and mike kane was there amongst uh, many other mps um and we heard from him about his uh his his, his commitments um so you know, we we um, and let me just be clear because as you're absolutely right, Helen, we are we're not party political. We don't affiliate to any political party. We're completely neutral in that respect. We work with whoever's in government, and we've worked very closely with a succession of um, um, ministers from the from the Conservative Party over the past uh, 14 years or, or so. Um, some with better results than others. Um, I would make the point if I may, because I love I love this statistic. Um, since since I came to Nautilus as Newmast in 2000. I've worked with uh, 17, uh, 17 maritime ministers, starting with Glenda Jackson and finishing with the last one, Lord Davies of, of, of Gower. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the lessons about that for me is we need governments to give maritime ministers time um because they're replaced far too often um and they need to they need to understand the brief uh and commit to delivery of the maritime 2050 as it is now i don't know what mike's plans are for that i'm hoping that we won't have a huge shift we don't need to waste time reviewing things we've done so many reviews over the years we know the answers they're all in our manifesto um so let's deliver them let's get working on that um and uh, give give the time and resources to a team who can commit to the to delivery of a whole package of, of measures, not pick shiny things that are easy to deliver and then move on to something else. So um, we, we need to engage with all political parties to, to, to get that message across and with the help of Clive and others contacting their parliamentary their prospective parliamentary candidates, giving them a copy of the manifesto, giving them the maritime worker pledge that Robert referred to earlier um we'll get this job done i'm very optimistic generally um and i'm very uh, you know very keen to get going once the election results are, are declared whoever's in power will get cracking on our, on on getting them to deliver our worker pledge and our manifesto yeah absolutely we we're already uh discussing our strategy post-election and i can see that robert's hands come up so robert i will hand over to you if you want to turn your video back on yeah, thank you. I just wanted to, to add on that, and hopefully Mark doesn't mind, Clive, just that, that I think we we have uh, built a good relationship uh, with Mike Cain over the last uh, two, two and a half years. Um, as Mark mentioned in the seminar that we had a parliament uh, not that long ago, um, Mike Cain did give a speech where, you know, I think it's fair to say a lot of what he was talking about, um, you'll see in our, in our manifesto. So look, again, no one's counting their chickens, you know, who knows what's going to happen after the election. Even if it is a Labour government, you know, there could be a whole uh, reshuffle anyway. Uh, but I think just on the point, I don't know whether your issue with, with, with Mike is on a, you know, constituency level or in relation to Maritime, but I would just say that, you know, w I think we are working well, but obviously the proof will be in the pudding post-election. And I think what we can guarantee is that as soon as that election is over, if Mike Cain is in place as, as um, the, the shipping minister, um, we have we've good contacts and we will be meeting with him early on, hopefully, um, to, to work out what his priorities will be. Um, but I think they have listened to what we've said, particularly post PO. Um, and if you look at some of the, the public um, comments that Mike has made, um, he, he does actually often reference Nautilus International. Um, uh, so I think I think it's positive. I think we have a good relationship. Um, but it's definitely, you know, the good relationship has to be uh, has to meet an end. And the end is what we have included in our in our manifesto. But certainly I will um, send you everything that you need, Clive. To, to speak to Mike and um, to send him. He already has the manifesto. Uh, don't worry about that. But um, it's always a lot better when it comes from a constituent as well. Uh, so, good point. Um, yeah, I will. Uh, I'll certainly send that through to you. But thank you. Great. Good stuff, Robert. I've just got a keen eye on the time and we will have to uh, stop the webinar in six minutes time. So if anybody does have any final questions to put to Mark, um, please do get them in now. But Mark, I wondered if you might be able to give us a little bit more information around that uh, proposals for um, government uh, funding 
or a government fund for maritime skills linked to the CMDC that specifies, you know, a certain training element to it. Is there precedence elsewhere in the world? What do we kind of, do we have a, 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 a structure that we're basing this on? How do you see it working? Um, there, there aren't any precedents that I'm aware of. I mean, the just transition is, is although it's been an active conversation, certainly at international level and more recently at regional and national level in the in the last, certainly since uh, was it COP twenty six in 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 Glasgow. So that's the yeah. sort of where it all kicked off. I think, incidentally, I think Alan was heavily involved in that. Alan Dixon, who's on the on this call, so he'll remember all the calls from the just transition maritime sorry to the maritime just transition task force it's the only industry that has a a task force like this that involves trade unions un global compact ship owners so we've been we've been leading the way and you'll know that um there are calls for a, a levy um and the imo has been where that discussion has been going on there's been arguments about how much the levy should be and how much that's going to generate uh, and and you know there's there's billions of dollars essentially going into a fund to support the the just transition, and clearly for us at least part of that has to be the skills. I mean, it is centre stage of the just transition, and that isn't controversial. That is widely accepted. When I, when I think back, slightly divert diverting from the core question, but when I think back to my time in university in Cardiff in the in the eighties during the miners' strike, if you want to know what a tran transition doesn't look like. Well, there's an example for you where whole communities, whole a whole industry was basically closed down and everybody was just told to go and sign up. Um, and a just transition is uh, the opposite of that. And it's saying, you know, we have an opportunity to reskill and upskill um, maritime professionals. They have a stake in the future of their industry, continue to work with uh, alternative fuels, new technology, okay? etc so we don't see it as being in at all controversial that when you're in, encouraging and incentivizing ship owners to adopt clean fuel technology that there, there there shouldn't be a skills element to that so you get some money on the one hand then you need to commit to fund uh, the the just transition the skills element of the just transition on the other hand so um we we know that the these calls are being made by other unions um, in other countries but we're all making these calls now so uh, the only example I would say of a fund that already exists as part of the just transition is in the Netherlands the colon funds it's referred to um, and that's a, a typically far-sighted intervention by the Dutch government which has a very strong social dialogue um, and very strong social partnership at, at its core. Um, that uh, for those who can't make the transition, I mean, it's clearly part of a transition. If you're not able to reskill, upskill, or if you, if the fear of that change to new working is too is too much or too late in your career, then the option uh, of of changing your direction and going into retiring early or or, or indeed going into a, a new sector coming ashore or whatever then that can have severe financial consequences for for maritime professionals and the government has created a general fund which cfrs can also access to facilitate that that transition so that's just an important example of something that is part of the joint transition if not the the the, the major part we we hope um, for the most part, that uh, our maritime professionals want to continue to work in the maritime industry and that they will uh, embrace the new skills uh, and uh, and upskill, reskill to, to, to secure that, that future. And I'm very hopeful and optimistic that with the buy-in that we have for the just transition, um, it, I mean, it's now part of the conversation. It's not a, it's not a fringe discussion. This is centre stage. Um, uh, it's IMO, it's ILO, it's it's UN, it's governments talking about a just transition and making sure it's human centred and human focused. So um, yeah, I'm hoping that's uh, that's uh, that's something that uh, we can we can take forward with government. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Once the elections complete. Yeah, thanks, Helen.
Thank you, Mark. Um, so we are up against time, folks. Thank you all for joining us. Do remember, if you do want assistance in reaching out to your candidates, you can email campaigns at nautilusint.org and we can send you everything that you need. Um, also remember, this is a two-part series, so please do join us on Thursday at the same time when we'll discuss protections for maritime employment and social and employment rights. If you have any colleagues who you think would benefit from watching this webinar, please do send them over to our YouTube channel where they can watch on demand. And don't forget, if you're not in membership, you are not protected. So speak to colleagues about the benefit of membership because we are stronger together. Thank you and goodbye till next time. Bye bye.